It is a dangerous thing to be a pastor in 2020 and talk about issues like politics and race. We're going to talk about it today, and my suspicion is that uh, there will be moments where you think I don't see it right, and there will be moments where you think I have named your position right on. I want you to know from the very beginning that I love you deeply. I'm not trying I'm not trying to do anything other than to remind us of the centrality of Christ in the midst of a conversation that our culture is happening. But I am convinced and I am convicted that if we let the culture have these conversations and don't have the hard talks in the church, it will be the culture who dominates these conversations. And so I'm opening myself up here to tell you what I'm wrestling with and what I think the Spirit is saying to me as the pastor of this church. And my hope is that you will open yourself up, perhaps to be wounded for just a moment, but only wounded by the one who was wounded for us. Not by my opinion, not by my feelings, not by what I think is right, but by the Spirit who still comes and meets the church and cultivates us to be the bride of Christ. I have a particular concern for the church today in 2020, particularly in America. This concern certainly is for Christians, but it is for non-Christians alike. In a time of the internet, television, automobiles, consumerism, busyness, credit cards, it is easy to cultivate a network and a community that tells you exactly what you already believe. You can leave a church if the people don't believe like you. You can change the channel if the news isn't analyzing the world the way you would. You can find a meme on Facebook that someone has cultivated that tells you what you already believe and you can click share without checking to see if any of it is true whatsoever. I saw someone share a meme the other day and their comment was, I didn't have time to fact check it, but it sounds right. My oh my. Who is the audience for such a thing? Are you a Republican? Might I suggest to you Fox News or OANN? If you wanna, don't want to be quite so partisan, I, I would invite you to check out the Drudge Report or Wall Street Journal. Are you a Democrat? I might suggest to you MSNBC or CNN. If you don't want to appear so partisan, perhaps you would like to listen to NPR or read the Washington Post. No matter what you believe or think in terms of politics or the way the world works, we live in the perfect time for you to cultivate the stories that you hear to perfectly match what you already believe. Someone is carefully cultivating new stories to match your opinion, to drive clicks and views and ratings. And in a world just like that, we're able to surround ourselves with people and ideas that we already believe in, and we find ourselves deeply unchallenged. As a pastor, I grew up in a church where preachers every week were hoping that they could drive us crazy with conviction. And now, pastors are afraid of preaching conviction 
because they're afraid of a mass exodus. What is it that Jesus is doing in the center of all of this society? Where can we see the Spirit? What is Christ trying to do? And what concerns me as we head towards the 2020 elections, which is, by the way, like my fifth straight presidential election where I've been told this is the most important election of my lifetime, at some times you get bogged down in it. But what you hear leading into this election is very messianic language applied to both the Republican and Democrat candidate. Biden will save us from Trump. Trump will protect God and is good for Christians. Let's not be fooled by this conversation. It is Jesus who saves, and it is God alone who is good. Simon Sinek is a business writer that I like. He talks about leadership and economics and running organizations, and he wrote as sort of an aside to his main point in his most recent book, something that so clearly spoke to me, and I wanted to share with you because I think it's so vital for us Americans to take stock of this point. Through the 20th century, we had clear and common enemies in America. Now, we could talk all that we want about the right or wrong of enemy making as Christians, but as an American people, we had clear enemies and they were external enemies. The Great Depression, Nazis, Axis powers, communism. We as American people saw external threats with clarity and we could bind together to fight against them. Coming into the 21st century, we had attacks on the Twin Towers in New York City. These things bound us together as an American people. But when the Berlin Wall fell, from then on, save 9-11, we've not been super clear on what our enemy is. And as such, because we are a sinful fallen people, we are enemy seekers. And so Americans have stopped trying to rally around common causes and have begun to try to define who their enemy is in very new ways. For the first time in well over a hundred years, Democrats began to see Republicans as the enemies trying to destroy America. Republicans began to see Democrats as enemies trying to destroy America. And you can see it in the shift of the House of Representatives and Senate most clearly, where when I was born, there were Republicans left of some Democrats and there were Democrats right of some Republicans. That shift has completely dissipated. If you look at the political positions by voting record now, the right is the right and the left is the left. And there's a gaping middle that lacks conversation and grace. We know that every good story has a conflict. There is right or wrong, there is good and evil, there's protagonist and antagonist, and we know how to look for them because we have been taught well in our great educational system in the United States of America. But what's not clear to me and to us is why it is that we are making people who disagree with us the enemy. Maybe they're not the enemy. Maybe they're longing for the exact same things that you are, but have a different vision of how to accomplish it. Our marriages testify that there are strong differences of opinion that can be unified in ways that are powerful, negotiated, worked out, maybe even yelled at, right? But we recognize that in marriages, we have the same common goal for family flourishing, raising our kids well, helping our children become adults, right? We share goals even though we don't see them the same way. I want to submit to you that these problems that we're experiencing and feeling in the United States of America today are not terribly different than issues that were underlying the great conflicts and moments of power in the Scripture. Last week, Pastor Jake spoke to you from Acts chapter 1 and 2. He talked about this invitation from Jesus that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I want to ask you something. 
Do you feel powerful? Yes. I'm glad. We should. And if we don't, if the answer in our own gut is, I'm not experiencing, I'm not feeling power right now, my question to you is, are you looking for power in the midst of powerlessness from political icons or from the Spirit? Jake talked to us about these texts and how Uh, race and politics and religion and simple disdain for one another were the fabric at which the tension was to be found in the early days of Pentecost. That when Jesus invited his disciples to receive power and go to Samaria, this was not received as simple and good news. Take your perspective, change it, go to a place that has a different religion, race, and culture than you, and go knowing that you have power, that God will reconcile you to them, and the gospel and good news of God's salvation to them. That is not an easy command. It's not as easy as us memorizing a Bible verse and remembering the history of what happened. We sanitize the hard word that that was with 2,000 years between us. There were issues of politics and race that needed to be torn down by the Spirit in order for the vision that Jesus had for his people to go and do as they were commanded. But Jesus says go, and he sends his Spirit, and his Spirit lands upon a people who are not reading the Jerusalem Times or watching the NBC affiliate of Jerusalem. He sends his spirit to a people who have quieted themselves to pray together. He sends his spirit, and they break out of the room where they're protecting themselves and their ideas and their religion and their convictions. They break out of the protective room, and they go into the streets of Jerusalem. And Peter, of all people, fresh off his denial in these very streets, of Jesus as Lord, begins to preach, and the word comes to people of all nations in their native tongues. There is no discrimination between nations when the Spirit truly moves. Peter's preaching, his his preaching breaks down barriers of nationality, race, skin color, But here's the thing that I really want us to focus on as we think through this sermon today. Peter has this incredible moment in the Spirit. The Spirit blows wind through the room, lights fire upon his head, moves him to preach a confrontational message that Billy Graham would think was harsh in the streets of Jerusalem where his Messiah was just crucified. And Peter is not a finished product. Bathed in the Spirit as he is, filled with the Spirit, a Pentecost-driven evangelist and apostle for the gospel, Peter needs to continually be confronted by his prejudices, his beliefs, and the way even his religion holds him back from fully embracing the call he's given in Acts chapter 1. If you fast-forwarded with me through Acts to chapter 10, we're given this very famous story of Cornelius, who is a centurion sent to Israel against the will of Israel. He leads men from the vile and hated Rome. He fears God, but he is not a Jew. He fears God... But to Peter, he remains othered. He's a Gentile. God speaks to Cornelius and wants Cornelius to fully give himself to the story of Jesus, to be baptized into the faith, and to give his life to him. But God knows that Peter won't speak to him because Peter won't see him as a brother. And so just at the same time that God is working in the heart of Cornelius, a man of a different race and a different religion, Peter is confronted by God as well. 
And that story is found in Acts chapter 10, and I'm going to read that story to us today to remind us of this famous story. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 23. Would you join me in standing as we read the word of the Lord today? About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then the voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up, go downstairs, do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for, why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's not confuse what's happening in this text. Peter has biases, and his biases are tied to his religious convictions. He will not eat the animals that God himself is telling him to eat. Now think about the audacity of that, that God's voice comes, speaks clearly, and Peter points to the rules to ignore God. There are things on this sheet that are clean for a Jew to eat. But Peter's imagination can't even be to get up and to pick around the unclean foods and grab the things that he has eaten his whole life. His belief, his assumption is that that which is unclean has touched what is clean, therefore the whole batch is ruined. When the voice of God speaks to him, he receives it as if, as if it's a test, a test of his righteousness, a test of his beliefs, a test of whether or not he has his theology ducks all in a row. He says to God, surely not, Lord. The translation may also be, by no means. The American way of saying this might be, heck no. He's not going to do it. He knows the rules and he's going to keep to it. Now, he knows the rules that he was raised on, but the Spirit messed with those rules at Pentecost. Peter has already been filled with the Spirit. He's had all of the religious experiences that we expect of a good Christian man to have. And yet he remains wrestling with God about where to go, what is safe, and who is okay to associate with. Peter needs more visions of God to keep shaping up. One experience at Pentecost a few months ago is not enough to sustain and challenge his deeply held beliefs. He needs God to show up in a vision, in a dream once more to continue to shape him towards the kind of person that God wants him to be in the midst of a world that's rapidly expanding for Peter. 
it's safe for him to be a Jew preaching the gospel of Jesus around people who look just like him, talk like him, believe like him. He was called clearly to go to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He was given the power of the Spirit to do so, and he's still not going. Another vision is necessary. I invite you to join Peter here and to be suspicious of your own certainty. The things that you know that you know for sure may not be as sure as you know them. God has a way of ruffling up our certainties and calling us to new things. If Peter would have remained certain, he would have said something like, I must have eaten a funny lunch. That dream was messed up. But instead, the men who are Gentiles come to his door, invite him to go to a Gentile house, and Peter goes and he doesn't plug his nose at the door and walk in. He walks in and says, I have never done this in my life. This is against everything I believe. Walking across the threshold of someone who believes differently than me, looks differently than me, understands the world differently than me, is something I have never done before because I thought that that was not permissible for me. But I have clearly been called to come and to share a meal with you, not cooked in the way that I believe holiness is shown And the result of it is friendship, baptism, a fresh movement of the Spirit, and God waking up the world of the Gentiles to the possibilities in Jesus Christ. Peter's not done yet still. You would think at Pentecost, Peter would have gotten it. You would have thought that when he walked into someone of a different race and ethnicity's house and see God move amongst them in ways that he didn't imagine possible, he would have gotten it then. He still doesn't get it. He begins to travel the world. And Paul begins to notice a very particular problem with his friend Peter, is that when the Gentiles are around, Peter acts like he's free to be with the Gentiles. But when Jews start showing up, Peter backs away from being open to the Gentiles, to eating with the Gentiles, to to commiserating with the Gentiles, and he behaves very Jewish around his Jewish friends and very free to be around the Gentiles when the Jews aren't around. If you were to look at uh, Galatians chapter 2, Paul writes about this extensively. He calls Peter by his Roman name Cephas. He says in the most confrontational text between two friends uh, in, in Paul's writing, he says, I opposed Cephas to his face. I'm glad I wasn't in the room for that moment. That sounds deeply uncomfortable. I opposed Cephas to his face when he came to Antioch because he stood condemned. Around certain men, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when the, when the Jews arrived, he would draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles. Peter needed to continually be confronted with his own biases, whether by a movement of the Spirit or by a friend who would come up to him and say, you're not fully behaving the way we're meant to be behaving. And if this is the great Peter, the rock on which Jesus will build the church, perhaps we need to be confronted from time and time again as well by the way that our biases are making their way to the top And our behavior isn't fully Christian and not fully who God is calling us to be in the midst of this world. The text throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, has issues of race and politics baked into it in ways that we struggle to see just because of the distance from the time until now. I'll give you an example and place it in American terms so you can follow with me. If I said, I'm not a crook, Who am I pointing to? Nixon, right? If I said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, who am I talking about? JFK. JFK. If I said, read my lips, no new taxes, who am I alluding to? Bush Sr. If I said, it's the economy, stupid. Bill Clinton. 
If I said, I want to be a compassionate conservative with compassionate conservatism as president, who am I referring to? No? no uh, George W. Bush. That's interesting. He's the most recent I mentioned. But if I were to ask you to quote for me the most famous thing James Garfield said, what would you say? Or if I quoted James K. Polk or Millard Fillmore, would you know that I was referring to their big moments? The further that we get from history, the more and more we miss nuances and understand quotes and perspectives and beliefs that people have. We don't always have in our toolbox a way to see how political or racially divided the Scripture is. But these issues make their way in the text for those of us who have ears to see and eyes to hear that the people of God were struggling with these questions in ways that we are struggling now. And God would show up in ways to call them away from their simple beliefs and their divided meetings and gatherings. The Old Testament talks about opening up the edges of your fields for immigrants to eat. It talks about trying to befriend enemy nations. Jesus talks about enemies being our neighbor. He goes to the Samaritan woman and treats her as a friend and an equal. These issues are not just cute Sunday school stories. They're cutting against our ingrained beliefs and desires to be around people who think like us, talk like us, and look like us. And God is calling us, I think, to wrestle with those predispositions once more. Now, race has made its way into the cultural conversation in America. It is front and center. You can't turn on the news without seeing how it is people are talking about this. For, against, pro, anti, blame, anger. There's all sorts of things that are happening in our world today. And my sense is that the church is called not to turn away from the trouble, but to lean into the trouble. And I know, this is what I know, is that there are many people who think that racism has been solved a long time ago. And oh, how I wish it was so. But there are people who are confronted with racism on a day-to-day -day basis. And while you may not have experienced racism, or you may have, when people make racist statements against you, it changes at the core of your being who you are. You try to act different. You try to stand out less. You try to be less weird, but you're not weird. It is our problems, the one who makes the comment that are racist who have the problem, not the one who receives racism. And I know what the arguments against racism are. We, we could say, and rightfully so, I have never owned slaves. I have never known anyone who has owned slaves. These issues that are being talked about were generations before I was ever born. Why am I meant to be held culpable for what our great, 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 great grandparents did? And the truth of the matter is because we can be the generation that makes the change. We can be the generation who looks it in the face and says, enough is enough. And we have this in our theological toolbox to think about this issue of race. Because this is what I know, is that I have inherited the sin of Adam, but I never once stepped foot in the Garden of Eden. I didn't listen to my wife Eve and take a bite of an apple that God told not to eat, and yet my life has been deeply colored and stained by what happened in the Garden of Eden. I've received the curse of sin upon my life, and I've fallen prey to it because of something I never did. I received it, and I perpetuate it, but I don't let it go unchecked in my own life. I pray for forgiveness. I work towards repentance. I yearn to be right with God and neighbor. And that, my friends, is something that we can come to understand. We did not create the problems of the world today, but we don't have to be okay with them. 
Stanley Hauerwas is one of my favorite authors. He's an ethicist, a Christian ethicist at Duke University. And this is the heartbeat of me as a person and a pastor, this line that he says. He says, the task of the church is to serve as the best example of what God can do with human community. I'm going to say that again. The task of the church is to serve as the best example of what God can do with human community. And I hope that that is who Crossroads yearns to be, a place where race exists, diversity exists, but a place where we're taking it seriously to see one another as brother and sister in Christ more so than anything else. One of the tasks that I'm taking up in my own life, and I'm not arrived, I'm not great at it, but whenever I come to sit into a meeting at Crossroads, whatever it is, I take stock of who's in the room, male, female, white, black, Asian, and I ask myself two questions. Who is here and who is not here, and why is that? What I know is that representation matters. And I'm trying to work, trying to covenant with all people that all of us would be represented. That people, when we have deep and hard conversations, that someone that looks like you, that is roughly your age, that is roughly your perspective, roughly your politics, is represented in the kind of conversations that I have. Because it seems to me that that would be what Dr. Howard Wass is talking about in rooms where perspectives that are different, histories, skin tones that are different come together and work together to bring about the glory of God fully in this world, would be an example to the world of what community could look like. Because the institutions around us are not getting it right. So why not us? Why not the church lead the way in figuring out how to tear down barriers? Why not the church figuring out ways to create brothers and sisters out of one another? Why not the church showing the world how we can do it? And so in a politically divided and racially tense environment, I, I have a series of suggestions for you. Some of them will seem easy and some of them will seem hard. And again, I, I'm not going to be taking a test, right? So if you think I'm way off base, I'm also not going to call you up on the phone on Thursday and ask you how you're progressing on these things, okay? These are suggestions. First one, speak up and tell the truth. We live in a world, I think, where people are afraid to speak up because they're afraid to say the wrong thing. I say the wrong thing. I don't exactly explain what I mean in perfect language. In a world where cancel culture seems to be increasingly a thing, people are more and more afraid of speaking up because we're afraid if we say the wrong thing, we will be axed. If you say the wrong thing, if you're confronted and you're convinced, apologize. We all make mistakes. You're not going to get these sort of things right with the first words that come out of your mouth. Find your voice. Be willing to apologize when you don't get it exactly right. Tell the truth and don't be afraid of the truth. Number two, if your politician says something racist, something that calls people away from the truth in Christ, call them out. And I say this for a very particular reason. It is one thing if you hate Donald Trump to call him out on racism. What concerns me is he says things like calling the coronavirus Kung Flu or that Mexicans are bad hombres and that it's his supporters that aren't calling him out. You don't have to disagree with his economic policy and vote for Joe Biden when you see what is wrong, right? If you're a Republican and you agree with him on 75% of things, you don't have to baptize the whole. People I know in our church community are being hurt by the kind of things he says. People are transferring the lead that they get from the president and pouring it onto people in their own community. And that's not to say that Biden is better. He recently said something to the effect of, unlike the African-American community, with notable exceptions, the Latino community is an increasingly diverse community. What? Like, there's one kind of black person, Joe Biden? No. 
No, right? But if you're on the left side of the conversation, don't say, well, I think Trump is worse. No, call it out from inside your camp, right? You know how to find your local Republican and Democrat office. You can call up people in your own party on the phone and say, I plan to vote for our candidates, but I would appreciate a tone from our people that's more in keeping with civility, kindness, and humanity. Call it out in your own camp. I had a poli-sci professor in college who helped me think a lot about why people vote the way that they do. He gave us a list of like 70 issues. It's just an insane amount of issues. And he told us to rank them in terms of importance to us. And we ranked them in terms of importance to us, and it came out, and it, it told us which party we're more likely to identify with. And then he said this when we were looking at it. He said, the reason I had you rank it is because people are very, very likely to skew hard towards their number one issue. Skew hard to their number one issue. So if for you the most Christian thing you can do is to fight for unborn babies, it's very possible that issue two through five is more left-wing, but that number one draws you to the Republican Party with all of your heart, because that's your number one issue. If your number one issue is trying to solve homelessness, it's very possible that your next three issues might be issues that are right-wing, but you might be drawn to the Democrat Party because we're so partial to the issue that matters the most to us. And we can go on and on and on about issues that are deeply Christian that draw us in one direction or the other. The truth of the matter is all of us probably have things that disgust us from the political party we tend to vote for. But we're most likely to identify with one, two, or three issues in a party that draws us like a magnet pull towards us. That doesn't mean that you as a Christian have to let the rest of the stuff go. I read a letter by a Christian leader recently who confessed that he was troubled by Trump and was going to vote for Biden in a way he'd never voted for Democrats in his life. But he said, after I vote, I will continue to write like crazy to Joe Biden asking him to change his policies that I deeply disagree with. And I thought that is, that is a way for us to think moving forward as a Christian people. N not the voting part, I don't care who you vote for. I I'm serious about that, I don't care who you vote for. But we have got to be Christian first and partisan second, right? Like the story of Jesus should confound the world that sometimes we sound like a Republican and sometimes we sound like a Democrat. Why? Because we're not trying to perpetuate American politics. We're trying to tell the story of Jesus. And that should be our major testimony in life. Don't be afraid to confront your people when you feel like they're wrong. Number three, utilize the church to become friends with people who think, look, act, talk, and vote differently than you. Let their stories of hurt and pain move you. Let their convictions push you. This week, as I tried to put this sermon together, I went out of my way to talk to Democrats and Republicans. I talked to African Americans, and I, I found myself in a police department for an hour and a half, unarrested, thankfully, although there were a couple times I was nervous, if I'm honest, Karen. But when the narrative is you've got to choose people of color or the police, I, I don't like to live in polls like that. We have police officers in this congregation that I love and respect with all of my heart. And we have people of color in this congregation that I respect and love with all of my heart. And my suspicion is that most of those people aren't buying the polls that we're told that we have to choose. Our police officers are working hard to show love to the black community in our county. Our, our, our black people don't want to see universally, I think, police departments completely wiped off the map, right? There's all sorts of shade in the middle of this conversation where people land. And hearing stories of unfortunate incidents between people of color and police 
and also moments where police were in deeply intentional of trying to protect people of color are very important for us to hear because the truth is far more complicated than jumping into a camp and landing there. And living in a church, coming to a church like Crossroads where you don't have to look far to find someone who looks differently than you and believes differently than you gives us an opportunity to see the scope of truth in far more complex ways than we often deal with it. Let people's stories of hurt and struggle move you. Become friends with people who poke at your bubble. Not so that you fully change, right, but so that you become open to other possibilities. Number four, don't read more social media, watch more news, or argue on the internet more than you spend time with Christian friends, read the Bible, pray, or other Christian disciplines. I deeply am concerned about what is discipling Christian people these days. We go to church less than we ever have, and we participate in arguments more so than we ever have. Check your own social media. Are you an evangelist for a political party or for Jesus? Are you celebrating electoral wins or are you celebrating your family? Are you talking about who saved your soul or who's going to save America? These questions may sting, but I solely want us to be pointed to Jesus. Number five, join a small group. This could help with number three. But we do this on purpose, to have the ability to sit around and talk about ideas with people, to not necessarily be in control of what groups we show up at, to sign up for a name and a class and a time and understand that that group may push us we may hear things that we don't necessarily think about or agree with, but we can do so in Christian community in a way where Jesus is Lord and centers us. Number six, this is my final one here, know that the politics of Jesus don't line up perfectly with partisan politics. The more you know Jesus, the more you will confound Democrats and Republicans. And so let me give you some things, and I'm going to end on this, that give me hope. Because I don't want this to just be like a full confrontational sermon, but there's great reason for hope in our world today too. Number one is Crossroads is a diverse church with diverse races, with diverse skin tones, skin colors, political affiliations, and somehow, some way, only by the work of God, we find an incredible unity in this place in creed, mission, and eternal hope in Jesus Christ. We have work to do. We don't always get it right. But God is knitting together a people here that is beautiful and diverse. And every single time I gather together with you all, I walk away filled with hope of what God can do in our world. So another thing that brings me hope is that uh, Lorene Huffman hosted a women's Zoom during the height of quarantine where she invited a friend who's African-American, who she had spent time in the military with, and who had pushed her on her own uh, racial struggles. And a whole bunch of our women showed up and they had a talk about the difficulty of, of uh, race relations and learning how to be more hospitable and open to people of color. And that, that conversation, I, I didn't ask her to have it. She did it on her own as a leader of the church. And people showed up and had a really, really compelling conversation where they listened and shared and did so with such incredible hope. Pastor Jesse told me the story that as, as racial tension was rising in America, he walked by one of our teenagers who's black and asked him about his own experiences and how, how Pastor Jesse and how the church could improve to help. And the teen said that Crossroads is one of the safest places from racism in his life. And I'm so thankful to hear a testimony like that. We don't always get it right, but moments like that remind me that there's hope that we're heading in an exciting direction. I'm encouraged that the U.S. Con congressional district that we currently live in has two African Americans running against each other. And they're talking about issues of race. 
And you may agree with how one is framing it and how the other is framing it. That's not the point, really. But I'm encouraged by the fact that we're taking very seriously the stories and perspectives of African Americans, even in our politics, in the neighborhood that our church is in. I'm also encouraged by three conversations I had this week with people from our congregation. And their conversations were videoed in the church and will be available on our YouTube channel on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. One person was uh, from South Africa and grew up in apartheid and then, uh, and then saw apartheid break. And she voted in the first ever election, uh, free election in the country's history where Nelson Mandela was elected. And she talks a little bit about uh, the story of living in South Africa in that time. And I kept telling her about how this was just a news story to me. I remember this happening, but didn't understand. And she kind of helps us understand about what she saw in that time. I talked to an African-American man in our church about his experiences in life. And I talked to a Korean-American woman about her experiences. And all of them have moments of, of gut-wrenching pain to hear and see what they've seen and gone through. But they all end with incredible hope about who, what the church can be and what brings them hope and, and how hopeful they are that God can knit together the struggles of this world. They brought great hope to me. And I hope they do the same to you. The band is going to come out as we conclude today. My hope and prayer is that you have heard my heart today, that my heart is for God to break down the walls that have been created in our world, for us to be more racially sensitive, racially open, racially aware, and to do it in a way that only the Spirit can call us to do. May we be in tune with what the Spirit is doing in the way that Peter was. May we be open to hearing what God is doing, and may we have the audacity to react when God calls us. Would you join me in standing as we sing this final song?